thank you all for joining me today. I, I, I'm actually an enormous fan of the show. Um, I hated how it made me feel <laughs> for the first two thirds. And then I got to the point where, um, you know, I was able to round the corner and just be like, oh God, this is so moving. And I still hated the way I felt, but um, <laughs> I saw the, the larger picture. So let me, I want to start with you, Stacy. I know that the very first nugget of, of what would become Mrs. America came from you. What was it about Phyllis Schlafly in particular that made you think, okay, this is a woman who, who could serve as, the, as the, kind of the cornerstone of a series? Um, you know, she was just a fascinating contradiction. You know, she clearly lived her life with feminist values, with her own agency, but she was fighting against her own best interests or... You know, um, and, and I think it's what makes the show so incredibly modern today because she was very divisive. People dismissed her and she still pulled off this sort of um, revolution in a way of, you know, of the, of the religious right in this country. And I think it's the same way that people kind of dismissed Donald Trump and he ended up, you know, at... at putting us all in lockdown right now since we haven't had a proper response to the coronavirus. So I think that's, that was, it, it was interesting to tell the story in, um, in an unconventional way that, um, and, and enter unexpectedly with a person that most people didn't know about. Davi, I know that you are Canadian and we forgive you for that, but uh, <laughs> that we also know that like being exalted now <laughs> since in recent years that's true that's true well, well will we forgive you for all our envy is, uh, is actually <laughs> where that comes from it comes from a place of deep and abiding jealousy and i have so, a Canadian passport uh, and i could yeah, drive yeah. up again if they open the borders to get out of here so what was your what was your address again i can get it <laughs> it's not a, you can hide yeah. it in my basement for sure Libby. Thank you. Thank you for secreting me across the border. Uh, but I do know that your your dad was a professor of political science. You, met, you majored in history. But how familiar were you with Phyllis Schlafly and the history of the ERA and the history of Stop ERA uh, when, when you came onto this project? Not very. You know, I grew up in Canada. We didn't learn anything about the Equal Rights Amendment, although now I'm hearing that even in the States, no one was learning about the Equal Rights Amendment, which uh, is- Yeah, lot. also true. Yeah, also true. Um, so I took a women's studies class uh, in college, and that's where I first was introduced not only to the second wave feminist, but also to Phyllis Schlafly. And probably the, the most I knew about her was from reading Susan Faludi's book, Backlash, which was really seminal to my thinking about feminism. Um, and she went into great detail about Phyllis Schlafly. But I didn't know very much when Stacy brought it up to me. Um, but I thought, you know, given my love of politics, I really wanted to create a political drama series. And the idea of doing one centered on women just really appealed to me because I hadn't seen that done. It's usually political dramas are centered on men and they're written and directed by men. So this was very exciting to me to write about women, not as mothers or daughters or sisters, but as ambitious women who are unapologetic and who are seeking agency and advancement of other women. And also the women who are seeking to, you know, keep change from happening and, uh, you know, keep thing to keep the status quo. That sort of all those multifaceted ways of being a woman really uh, intrigued me. But I was actually writing the pilot during the 2016 election and completely had to reconceive of what the series would be following the election because it was no more about the women's movement and the backlash to it. But there was a larger story that I wanted to tell, which is about the rise of the religious right and how the far right got into power. And Phyllis is such so central to that story, which really tell, explains where we got to where we are today, where something as basic as equality is, is, as Kate mentioned earlier, like so polarizing. Yeah, actually, and that's the one of the things that I love so much about the series is that uh, my wife and I were, made, were raised in the Midwest. She was in a very conservative Christian family. Um, she bought, she knew all about Phyllis Schlafly. She was raised in the religious right. And we, uh, our lives were negatively influenced by these theories that she was espousing. And so it was so strange when the show was announced and we were like, whoa, other people know about Phyllis Schlafly. Like this is, this is a, this is a thing. Now, as that said, 
she does feel very much like she exists in, in a kind of a niche area of American political history that, yes, has a lot of influence in where we are now, but that we didn't really, wasn't really common knowledge. Kate, what was the appeal in playing, in playing her? How, how did you come to the project and why was it the right project for you? It was, for me, it was about being part of the conversation. Uh, I wanted, I'm, I'm not interested in presenting my own political beliefs or making work in my own image. The process of inhabiting a character and being part of a telling a story is to try and understand, um, you know, it's far more fascinating to inhabit people who think nothing like you, who whose frames of reference have you know, nothing like your own. It, you know, you build a bridge of empathy in a way to, to their experience. And that the, what I was witnessing post, particularly what was revealed um, uh, in the wake of the, the 2016 election was just how divided the country was and that you, you would speak to people in certain states from socio, a certain socioeconomic standing, so certain cultural groups um, of certain genders and they would feel that the Obama administration had left them behind, had ignored them, that they felt outside of America and that their interests were not being represented. And I thought, well, how can you possibly say that when you've actually really been in power for you know, several hundred years? You know, there was a real, but there was a schism. People felt they were outside. And Phyllis, I didn't realise how much of a grassroots outsider she actually was. And that, um, and I think that that was probably her, her continued position and why, why she didn't ultimately, why she wasn't given a, a, a position in Reagan's cabinet is she was too polarising and too much of an outsider. But I think that it's, I was interested in trying to find a way to um, be part of a conversation that built a bridge between what seemed to be polar opposites, you know, whether they were polar opposites from a gender perspective or political perspective. You know, I think drama has the ability to, to do that. And, um, you know, I think our political discourse, not just in America but globally, has become so divided that we can't have nuanced conversations about things as important and apolitical as equality and so I thought, you know, when, when Darby and Stacey came to, to pitch the series to me, Phyllis was secondary to, to my, to my um, wanting to be involved. I just wanted to be part of helping to scaffold that kind of conversation with an audience. It's not a documentary. You know, there's a, you know there, there will be a lot of emotional invention, but it's based on fact and you can only understand where we are now by understanding where we were in recent history. And I think that there's so much um, that I have learned about personally by going through the series about why we are where we are right now. Right. Not just as right. women, but as, you know, American citizens, you know. Yeah. Is that part of why, it, you know, it was important to you to, to be such an active executive producer on the series? I talked to Sarah Paulson a few weeks ago and, and she just raved about you obviously but but talking about your long hours and calling her like sending her texts about her character and and just how how um, committed you were to this project. I'm just bossy no well um, I mean that was the undercurrent she was getting yeah, at of course, no, of course, no 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 well you know I, I I work mostly in the features space and so to work in serial television, although this is obviously a limited series, um, was a new experience for me. And you need stamina <laughs> to, to, you know, to, to, to embark on something like that. Not only the hours, but the, just the breadth of the story and that you, you need to know what your role within it is. But I think you also need to know that the story is rich enough and deep enough and you're... Fellow Uzo, speaking of fellow players. Hi, all. Fellow players. Amazing. Oh, sorry. Amazing. Like Uzo was, you know, that that it can sustain your it can sustain your interest. Um, and I I I, look, you you have to have um, I think ultimately you don't tell a story without an audience in mind. 
And with every passing day, this story just became increasingly more relevant and important to tell. Not important in a worthy sense, but in an urgent sense. But, you know, so that was the audience perspective. But personally for me, I felt like I, I, I was suffering from PTSD and I needed, to, I needed to understand why I was going, feeling all this stuff and, and to find a way to scaffold and reverse engineer how I got to this place or, you know, how we'd all got to this place. So it was, it was, right. it was, it was actually a very urgent need of mine. I think to be part of it, you know, and it's, and I, I think that, you know, um, it's, it's, the role has always been secondary for me and it's, it's been, it's been, you know, the, the, who's, who's designing the costumes, who's behind the camera, you know, who's doing the catering, all, I'm, I'm Australian, I come from a very non-hierarchical, you know, uh, film industry and so all of those things are very important to me, whether I'm, you know, involved from a producerial perspective or not. Oh, that's great. Uzo, welcome to the chat. Um, we're so glad you're here. Let me ask you, I'll, I'll throw you an easy one as opposed to all of these curveballs I've thrown everyone else. Um, <laughs> tell me about joining this project. You had a really challenging role of, of stepping into the shoes of, of, of Shirley Chisholm. Um, how, how, how was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> how did that yeah. go? No, we know how it we know how it went but um what was the what was the mental journey like deciding to to step into that role um it was thank you for having me it was um you know an honor um it was um exciting because I knew who she was. My mom was a big Shirley Chisholm fan, you know, but I didn't have, you know, a wealth or a depth of knowledge about her. Um, in terms of policy, uh, I knew her historical relevance. Um, it was really exciting getting on the Zoom with um, Stacy and Davi and uh, Carmen and chatting and knowing that there were going to be all these women who were amazing and smart and forces behind the scenes uh adding kate into that also on the ep side but also on the performance side who is you know our, i say it, i'm gonna say it again who is our best she is this generation's best um and i and is an amazing craftswoman and knowing that the entire company was um comprised of amazing people it was exciting um margo and tracy both of whom are phenomenal oh, yeah. it was ex it was exciting and i think that helped to distract me from what i needed to, <laughs> to to be like these are the coolest people ever who are just all phenomenal and then um also be like and charlie chisholm um it was also <laughs> um which was it was it was it was it was exciting um and at points terrifying, but also really wonderful um, after reading that script as well uh, by Tanya to know that we were telling more of her story than just okay. the woman we would see on the stage, on the pulpit, on our televisions even, we were looking to capture a lot of the innards of who she was and what it meant really to be the only. Speaking of reading the script, we would have, um, you know, at lunchtime as we went along, you know, because obviously schedule was tight, we would have a read through at lunchtime of the upcoming episode. And at lunchtime, we all, you know, in our hair and curlers, we'd rush from the set and we read the Shirley episode. And Uzo, I, you probably weren't aware of it because you were so in the cone. It, even at the table read, we all just went, oh, <laughs> my God, that is the series. I said, we don't need to film that. We, we, just, we just experienced that. It was just, it just, you, it, it leapt off the page and, it, and into, your, into your mouth and it just, it's like, a, it, was, it was like the most astonishing piece of theatre, you know, when you just think, I know why I'm doing this now. I know, I know why I'm here and I'm such a privilege 
to, to you know, I'm like, well, I'm backing up my bags. <laughs> <I'm going. laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing, even from the read through. Well, that that actually is a is a perfect transition to a question I have for Tanya. As the writer of Shirley, um, the entire series was very was very episodic. Every uh, every episode played like its own little sort of one act play. Do you feel like that setup lent itself well to to your strengths as a play writer? Because um, I, I know you've worked on other tel- TV series. Was this different at all? Was it easier? Was it harder? Um, tell me about your experience. Well, this was harder because we were trying to do justice to all these women and we wanted to do exactly what you said to create an episodic story for the feminists um you know and that that's how you get the names of the show of the episodes but also that you can get a dramatic arc for them as well you know which is a very sort of playwright type thing to do where you really see that the feminists grow and they change. And that was important to us to tell the feminist story almost like a hero's journey. So that in episode three, in the Shirley episode, where you see this fracture and they're not able to figure out how to reconcile all the diverse voices. By the time you get to episode eight, there's been a sea change and it comes with great struggle for them, but they realize ultimately that Unity is not sameness. Unity is figuring out how to take a lot of different parts and make a whole. And that's what they ultimately do. And so one of the things that I, I was so excited about with the, with the series is that we're going to tell a story that arcs and that you can just tune into the Shirley episode and really get the Shirley story. And you can tune in obviously to the pilot and get the the foundation of Phyllis, sort of like the origin story. You can tune in to, you know, Bella and Betty and Jill and Gloria and all the people and you get those little slice. But if you watch the whole series, the sort of sum is greater than the parts. And one of the things that was so exciting to me about Shirley is I got to really invest in Shirley as a character, both in episode three, but also in four, when we discovered, you know, through like copious research, that she was really punished for her run through this like fraud investigation, you know? And when we found that, it was like, oh my God, this is this is, we have to tell this story too. And when we discovered that she stood up for the secretaries in episode six, that she put herself on the line, no one else did. And the secretaries, they didn't look like her, but they came to her because they knew she would fight for the voiceless. And so being able to tell, you know, that that story as a playwright coming from the theater, that was exciting to me. Yeah, that was, it was, that was very moving and, and, and brings me to my next question. We sit here and uh, as we have recorded this, um, Joe Biden has announced his choice for vice president, Kamala Harris, uh, first black woman to run on a major ticket as vice president, an issue we saw addressed in the series when Shirley Chisholm was not selected for that position. Um, it reminds me again how much the show is in active conversation with the world around us uh, right now. How startled were you with how little we've changed since those times when you when you started really digging into the research? And this is a question for all of you. I know we are learning that um, Joe Biden picked Kamala Harris. I really had mixed emotions on the one hand, of course, it's thrilling to have a black woman on the major ticket for vice president. I'm like, why not president? And why did it take, as you said, 40 years? And I think one of the hardest things for all of us as we were in the writer's room and as we were doing the research and figuring out what happened in the seventies was we couldn't believe how many conversations, you know, like that conversation between Shirley and Bella in the Jill episode about what to do about the congressmen who are sexually harassing their secretaries is probably the same conversations they're having about Al Franken not two years ago. And so it's just very, both we've seen how much things have changed. And I think we've come a long way in terms of um, understanding 
intersectionality and how important it is to social change movements, but in many ways things haven't changed and just realizing the cyclical nature of change and how challenging it is to make meaningful change and radically transform our country uh, and how often the backlash can be quite successful. We're seeing a backlash that was launched in the 70s reverberate in the White House today. That, you know, we definitely had, right, Tanya, some depressing <laughs> afternoons in the writer's room where we were like, women can't win. <laughs> Yeah, we, we were struggling with um, the political moment, as it were, in the writer's room and finding a way to put that into the work. And some of the conversations that we had in the writer's room, they were tough conversations. You know, we had a very diverse room and we got into it and we explored it and we threw up our hands some days and it was about gender, it was about race, it was about sexual orientation. And we were really struggling with these things. And it was the sense, I remember one day Davi said, it's like, it would just be so much easier not to tell a diverse story, because, you know? And she said, but I'm committed to doing that even if it makes the TV harder, you know, even if we're working longer hours, even if we're having to put more of our hearts and our souls and our thoughts into this. But she was committed to making the narrative intersectional. And, um, and we all got into it and it was great. And I have to say that the writer's room were all still so close today because we were willing to just sort of go for it. And Tanya, I think your episode is a great example of how we were really committed to making the narrative of the series intersectional, even though the history didn't jump out. You know, Shirley and Phyllis never intersected as storytellers. Right. That's not great for television, right? <laughs> so then we had to think, well, how can we have the story of, of this episode speak to each other thematically? And that's where the choice came in to tell the story of Shirley's run for president and Phyllis um, launching her national campaign to have it thematically speak to women and race and power so that we had to find really creative ways to tell the story because the history didn't exactly line up as like a storyteller's dream often. And I think your episode is a great example of that. And exactly. we're all really committed to that. It, it meant some late nights. <laughs> it did. But the other thing that was also exciting is that we were, you know, one of the things when you're telling stories about women of color, when you're telling um, stories about women, white women, all sorts of people, uh, people of color in general, is that you have to look in the footnotes of history to find the story. And then you go through those footnotes and you find that little thing, found that little thing about Midge, found the little story about the secretaries, found the little thing about Shirley, the investigation into Shirley. And we thought that's where the story is. So actually a question for, for Kate and Uzo. Um, the thing about having a series that's such a murderer's row that has such a stat cast and such, such depth in character building um, is the fact that you were kind of running two separate shows. Uh, like Davi and Tanya said, like Phyllis and, uh, uh, Phyllis and Shirley never cross paths. Like, did you feel uh, isolated from each other at all? Well, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, Sometimes the, you know, um, the, the form of something reveals its true meaning. There was, there was one moment which we had on the hottest day, you know, in, our, in, you know, in history. Both of us were wearing triple wool where Shirley was giving a, a little mini press conference, uh, you know, in, on, on, on the streets outside uh, the house and Phyllis was walking in. So it was kind of shows coming out, Phyllis is walking in, and Phyllis just notices this powerful black woman who's got a lot of media attention. Meanwhile, she's a nobody, who know, you know, she has no kind of uh, profile in, in, in Washington, which is a kind of an interesting irony given where things ended up. And I, as I walk past, if, you, if people watch it again, all they can see is an actress's regret saying, <laughs> I don't get to work with her. This is, our, this is our moment. 
that is it. But you know, you think you think what what a shame if if these if, you know if 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 Phyllis was able to look behind the kind of the the obvious things that separated them, you think they may have found a similar struggles in common, you know, and and so I, it, it, that irony was not lost on me. But it was an actress's pain that is <laughs> just sitting on screen as I'm walking by. But I get to watch the episode, so you know that was a joy. It, you know, um, the same also. Yes, I remember that day very well. <laughs> but I was like, but no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, um, and it was nice to have that 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 touch of experience uh, of of Phyllis and Shirley, Kate and I in that episode one. I also thought it was really interesting, just from like a theatrical end. I thought it was so cool. Like while we're both like wishing we could touch here, I also thought it was really cool how you felt Phyllis touch every single one of these women's story and what that symbolized in the end, really, that though we did not cross paths in the physical form, she absolutely impacted my life and the lives to come after, you know, um, and watching that needle be thread in that way, you know, watching her encounter every single one of these women's stories. Um, and be so a part of our tribe, even though Kate was not, uh, or excuse me, Phyllis Kate was not on the pro ERA side in the scenes. She, her character and presence was felt daily. It was felt immensely. I mean, down to I think it's the end of episode one when, uh, isn't it when Tracy uh, Betty knocked the mug over? You know, accidentally. She was such an alive force and character in the space he, and i mean here's the thing also I, I imagine a little bit in my head one because she's so powerful two also you know as uh margo's character bella says she's the most liberated woman in america so of course she's in here mm. you know absolutely but it's also you know it's it's never and this is something i think about you know on a daily basis is you you never underestimate an outsider you know, because an outsider understands struggle. Mm -hmm. And there are a myriad of people who either are outsiders or perceive themselves to be outsiders um, in, in America. And I think that that's a, you know, once you unlock that perspective, um, I, I think it allows you to listen to the dog whistle, you know, um, conversation that we perhaps don't hear in our own bubbles. And that I think that this series really, um, my hope for it was that it would n ignite conversations across ac ac across party lines because there's a lot of intersection between, you know, that the noise, the political white noise often prevents us from seeing, you know, those those points of intersection as, as someone as diverse as, as, as Shirley and Phyllis. And, you know, like, and I think that, that Phyllis's legacy is, is, is dubious and I think, you know, I can't remember... You know, I was reading a really interesting assessment of the of, of the series about you know that we're living in Phyllis Schlafly's America for better or for worse, and you know I I, I do think that it's important to to understand that perspective. You don't have to agree with it, but you have to understand it so you know how to counter it, you know how to interface with it, and you know how to be in dialogue with it because you know a part of a democracy is is living with difference. You know, and there's a lot of difference in this series, you know, that this gives voice to. Right, right. And Dottie, let me ask you, because this series is fiction um, based on fact, uh, how how has the response been, uh, especially I know that, that uh, Gloria Steinem has had some things to say, um, which I'm sure is, is inevitable when someone is... is, is making a fiction version of you. Um, how, how, how have you weathered that? And, and did you prepare yourself going in knowing that this was bound to be controversial? controversial? 
you know, I, I never um, worked on a series. I've worked on a lot of period dramas, but never, but they were always sure. fictional characters. This was the first time I was dealing with not only a real period of history, but a very, con- like you said, controversial period in history. So we knew going in that this was going to be controversial. And to be honest, if this, you know, whenever you center a series on such a polarizing figure like Bill Schlafly and on such a fraught time in history as the 70s were, it's going to be controversial. And if there was no controversy surrounding the series, then we would have, that means we put out something very boring. So I'm really happy. (laughs) And actually I find it very gratifying to see that it sparked so much conversation. And I find it really interesting, you know, maybe because I'm the daughter of a therapist, but I think people's response to the series says more about them than it even does about the series. You know, everyone is just projecting their own life experiences and where they're coming from and their attitudes and values onto the series. And so for people who are on the far right, they're watching the series like, yes, Phyllis is making a lot of sense. And, and people, if you're on the left, you're like, she's a monster. So it's been really, I think actually very interesting. I think the most gratifying response that I've heard from so many people, especially young women and men, is that they feel so galvanized when they get to the end of the series galvanize to make change, to never be complacent. And that, that probably is the most gratifying response I've heard. That's, that's incredible, especially heading into an election. Um, (laughs) I know ladies, thank you so much. I've taken so much of your time and I really appreciate you, you being here and chatting with me. Thank you for this beautiful piece of art that you have given all of us. Um, it, it, it truly, it truly moved me. So um, thank you. I'm going to let you all go. Um, I'm going to let all the publicists go. Um, but thank you all. Have a good day. Enjoy your next panel wherever I'm sure No panels. No, we're going to the beach. So good to see everyone. <laughs> you too. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Libby.